on today's Rock and Rant number 31, 21 things you may not know about Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti. You're listening to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus, changing rock history one podcast at a time. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus, Rock and Rant number 31. Led Zeppelin's Physical Graffiti, 21 Things You May Not Know About It. But first, you are listening to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus, and our website is ludinirockandrollcircus.com. Tons of cool podcasts there, rock and rants, guitar casts, all kind of fun stuff there. So check it out, ludinirockandrollcircus.com, and um, I think you're gonna I think you're gonna have a good time there. <laughs> okay. And anyway, let's get to today's topic, which is 21 facts about physical graffiti. Now the reason we're doing this is because this week there was a bit of an anniversary with physical graffiti. This was the week that it was first certified uh, gold. It ended up going platinum, something like 16 times. Excuse me, like something like 16 times. Carreze, right? Uh, so it's a classic album. It was also finally where critics and fans kind of both agreed on Led Zeppelin. Up to this point, fans loved them. Critics, not so much. This record kind of brought it all home. It's really kind of considered their magnum opus, their their crowning achievement. So here, to, anyways, it was released in February tw- uh, tw- 24th of 1975. Uh, 1974, excuse me. Um, when Physical Graffiti was released, all five Led Zeppelin previous albums re-entered the charts. So they ended up with six albums on the charts. They were the first band to do the six albums on the charts all at the same time. Go Led Zeppelin. <laughs> uh, Bronyar was written around uh, the time of Led Zeppelin three. And if you guys remember that album, that was a kind of an acoustic album, but it wasn't released until Physical Graffiti. Now, one one of the things you're going to hear, uh, kind of a reoccurring theme on this uh, this countdown, is there were a lot of tracks. That, the Physical Graffiti contains a lot of tracks that were like in different stages on previous albums, but weren't really completed or put together in their final form until Physical Graffiti. So it was a, almost kind of like a compilation record of older stuff for them. Uh, number three, Led Zeppelin were eager to record a double album. See, the double album at the time was considered very prestigious. The Beatles, you know, did the White Album, Stones do Exile on Main Street. Uh, I think about a year before Quadrophenia was released by The Who. So it was, you know, they were kind of eager to say, hey, you know, we can do this double album thing too. And it turned out really, really good. <laughs> um, number four, um, P- Paige talking about the, the famous riff for Cashmere, da da da, da da da, you know, that whole thing. Uh, he said he had a piece of music, been working on it, and on just the tail end of it, he had that riff, and he thought, I got to get in the studio with John Bonham and record this. He couldn't wait to do it at Headley Grange. Number five, the album was recorded in the spring of 74. A former, you know what, the album was released in 75. I said 70. It was released in 74. I go back. I apologize. I, I misspoke there. Uh, but the album was uh, released in the spring of, of 74. Uh, and it, and uh, excuse, excuse me, recorded in the spring of 74 uh, at a uh, former poorhouse called Hilly Grange. Uh, Jimmy Page like took a room there, but the rest of the band were like, it's too cold. <laughs> we're going to a hotel. And number six, they used Ronnie Lane's mobile record recording setup um, for... The recording of the album because the Stones mobile recording setup was too expensive. So they were budget minded, you know, for a bunch of guys who were committed to debauchery and partying. It was pretty, pretty mature of them, right? Um, uh, number seven, uh, one morning during the recording process, Bonham tries to sneak in 1,500 pills of this sedative called Mandrax. Why he needed 1,500 pills of this sedative, I don't know. But he tried to conceal them in the drums with his clear drums, like. So he got busted on it. His uh, the, the crew member pointed it out. Uh, shout out to Charles Beatty and Barb Hil- Hil- Hilarowski and Ben Valasek for uh, joining it with, with us live tonight. 
If you want to join with us live, I'll give you some more information about that at the end. Uh, number eight, uh, Bonham's uh, his his sound and the, the sound engineer said that, uh, about John Bonham. Ben, ben, Benji Lefever says, uh, like most drummers, uh, Bonzo uh, tended to exceed the limit more than most people would. Sometimes he was particularly cruel to Mick Hinton, who was his roadie, and Bonzo would punch him in the face for no reason at all. Like. Again, craziness, Led Zeppelin stuff. Uh, number nine, John Paul Jones, clavinet on Trampled Underfoot, heavily influenced by Stevie Wonder's Superstition. Um, Bill, what's up? Um, that is uh, it kind of like, duh. <laughs> I mean, when I heard, heard that, if you listen to it, it, it sounds a little bit more than just influenced. <clears throat> Led Zeppelin steal songs sometimes, right? Uh, they've been accused of it. I love Led Zeppelin. But number 10, In My Time of Dying is a reworking of a uh, Blind Willie Johnson song, which is you know, an old, uh, you know, uh, blues, acoustic folk blues artist from the South. Number 11, Houses of the Holy is on physical graffiti. It is not on the album before that, Houses of the Holy. I know, right? Again, these are, this is another example of songs that were on... Uh, or recorded during previous sessions being released or put together on um, for physical graffiti. Rick Rubin also says that this is the only Led Zeppelin song to heavily feature cowbell. I, I don't know. Maybe you guys could let me know about that. Uh, number 12, John Paul Jones almost wasn't on this record. He was offered a position as choir master for Winchester Cathedral, for, for the Winchester Cathedral. I can't talk for the Winchester Cathedral. And um, he almost, he got this gig, but he stayed in Led Zeppelin. Thank you, John Paul Jones. We do appreciate that. You turning down that, you know, that fame at the Winchester. <laughs> the buildings on the cover of the album, do they look familiar? Do they? Those, those, those of us that uh, were uh, watching MTV in the 80s, they look real familiar because this is the same building where the Stones film Waiting on a Friend for the, wait, you know, the Waiting on the Friend video. The Stones and uh, Led Zeppelin are very kind of intermixed here throughout this whole thing. There's another Stones, some other Stones stuff coming up. Speaking of the Stones, uh, number 14, Boogie with Stu. So that is a reference to Ian Stewart, uh, who was the piano player and road manager for the Rolling Stones. So Boogie with Stu. <clears throat> they cut some stuff outside. Um, and uh, there's a... The story where Robert Plant went outside to sing and he was attacked by a flock of angry geese. That's number 15. Number 16, Cashmere. Even though it's 8 minutes and 28 seconds long, the radio gave it a chance and played it because of the big success with Stairway to Heaven. And a lot of people feel that Cashmere kind of is a perfection of what Led Zeppelin was doing with Stairway to Heaven. These sort of kind of like longer, epic kind of kind of songs. And the so a lot of people feel that like Cashmere is a kind of same type of song as Everybody Heaven, only like tweaked out a lot, you know, uh, 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 a lot better. What do you think? Number 17, the session was marked by bouts of debauchery. Really? Led Zeppelin, like, duh. Um, but uh, the, the band did crazy stuff like led farm animals up through Headley Grange and let off flares off the roof and, you know, a bunch of, you know, typical Led Zeppelin party stuff. Number 18, recording was stopped for several weeks when Peppy... Uh, who was one of their roadies, drove John Bonham's brand new BMW into a wall. Bonzo was very angry and Pepe was terrified and he hid in a wardrobe for 36 hours. <laughs> the term custard pie refers to a woman's genitals. And that's all we're going to say about that. That's number 19. Number 20, Down by the Seaside, was a song that uh, they said, you know, we loved Neil Young's Down by the River. So we did Down by the Seaside. A little homage. I mean, Led Zeppelin, you know, they, sometimes they wear those influences right on their sleeves. And the last fact is not really so much about physical graffiti, but about an influence it has on Rage Against the Machine. Tom Morello says that the Wonton song was a major influence on the verse riffage for Rage Against the Machine's Vietnam. So there you have it. 21 facts and a few bonus things there that you probably did not know about Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti. Amazing classic album. Shout out to Charles, Barr, Ben, and Bill for hanging out with us live. Would you like to hang out with us live? You can do that if you go to lulombardirocks.com. Go to lulombardirocks.com and you can party with us live right here. Uh, plus you get access to all kinds of cool stuff, exclusive downloads and videos, all kinds of stuff you can't get anyplace else. 
Check that out at LouLombardiRocks.com. Guys, thank you so much for partying with me here at the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. And I will catch you guys all on the next podcast. Have a great night, guys. A great weekend, too.